here's the inverter, and it's actually been a few months since the last segment on this particular inverter. I think it's about time. Let's get this done. I would not intended to make this a repair video, but that's what it is now. So I need to replace this FET and figure out if anything else is bad in here. First thing I'm going to do is turn it on, just to make sure that uh, the majority of the capacitors dis are discharged. This thing hasn't been touched in months, so I'm sure that it is anyway. But uh, now i got to take it apart, and this is one of those exercises in tedium. There are one, two, three, four, five, six screws on this side, and four more on this side. Ten of them, along with ten of these heatsink pieces. After that, you can carefully slide it out. I also have to remove both end panels, a couple more screws there, a couple more over here. Save all of those in some sort of containers so I don't lose them. And then I have these heatsink pieces. They have to go back exactly where they were. Sometimes you have to bend the FETs back and forth to make sure that everything fits. For example, probably can't see it on camera, but there's this screw here. It cannot touch the FET or things will short out. It's got to go in between and miss them all. All those sorts of things are a real pain. But I am going to go ahead and start removing all of these and turn the camera back on. All of the screws are out, and now the print circuit board should just slide one side or the other. But usually you have something that is heat synced to the outer case. In this case, it's all of these output diodes. And especially when they get hot, these isolating pads, thermal isolating pads, tend to uh, stick. And then they no longer want to come off. So what I usually just do is take a screwdriver, put it on here, and pull them away. You don't want to go behind the FET or in this case the diode because you can tear the pad behind it and that will no longer electrically insulate but if you go right on top you can just pull them ahead and then slide it out of course remembering which way it came out I also need to take this heat sink off of all these transistors same thing here it probably glued on when it got hot so Take a screwdriver, put some force on it, pull it forward, which I can't do without blocking the camera, but uh, turn the camera off and try that, and pull these FETs away. Well, it turns out that many of these are stuck on there really, really well, so I'll do my backup plan. You can take a, uh, a pliers and pry them off. When you squeeze it, don't squeeze the plastic body. You can crack it. Even if you can't see it inside, you can delaminate the silicon from the uh, heat plate in the back. So just grab the metal heatsink portion, if you can, and give it a little twist. Then they'll pop right off. I don't like doing that unless I have to, though. And uh, then they come off that way, too. Now, when I got this inverter, I don't remember for sure anymore, but I'm pretty sure there were a couple of transistors on the output stage that had to be replaced and that this inductor had broken off from the board. So I resoldered that on. Now this particular FET here is completely blown up. So I know that's bad. I'm just going to cut it out and remove it. And I'll have to do some cleanup on the board there. But before I get to that, I want to see uh, what else on the circuit board, or component-wise, might be damaged. There's the burnt up FET. Nasty. I'll save this little heat sink pad and put that on the next one. If you don't have a replacement uh, thermal interface pad, electrically insulating thermal interface pad, you can use Teflon tape. That works, uh, but uh, usually just save what you got. That works just fine. Here is the circuit board. I'm just going to take some alcohol and a cloth, clean all of this stuff up, make sure that there's no damage or such to the traces. Just a little bit of IPA, isopropyl rubbing alcohol, and a cloth or paper towel, and it's not cleaned up perfectly by any means here, but I can tell that there is no PCB damage at all, so that is fine. Now it's time to check for other component damage. I have all of these FETs over here, and I peeled this one back so I could read the part number on it. 
It's upside down, I realize, but it is an IRF 1404. It's quite a good transistor, actually, uh, which I guess it has to be because there's not a whole lot in here for 1500 watts. Apparently not enough of them is what we just found out. But in any case, see if I can find a replacement for that one, but I also need to check all of these and make sure that they're good. There are these resistors that go to the drive circuitry, then you can see the PCB bars that drive those going running across here. And these are BJTs, which you probably can't see very well when it's dark. But uh, there are four of those TO92 through-hole BJTs on there. And those actually do the driving. Those are connected to all of those resistors. So I need to make sure that those are good. Now, it's difficult to tell if any of these parts are good for sure without removing them off of the circuit board and putting them into uh, more of a dedicated test. But for the most part, you can just ohm them out. That's a very good indicator of whether they're fried or not. So let's do our cursory test here. I have the board upside down. All of those FETs are on this side of the board here. And we have the gate on this pin and the source and drain on these two. And uh, it's the same all the way across. So basically, I'm just going to put my multimeter on ohms and check and see if the gate is shorted to any of these other pins, both uh, gate and drain. Here's the gate. And it does not appear to be shorted on any of them so far. Now, a lot of times there'll be some parasitic uh, connections on here that will be a certain number of kilo ohms. Sometimes that's all right. We're really just looking for something that's fairly low impedance, a few hundred ohms or so. And all of these seem to be pretty much open circuit. So that's good. Gates in effect like this are many mega ohms, often giga ohms of impedance. So the only continuity should be parasitics on the circuit board. And there's none of that here. So now let's check between, uh, for example, the uh, drain and source. And here, there will be some connection, but again, it should be a relatively high impedance. Usually when a FET is fried, this ends up being shorted. Hundreds of ohms, hundreds of ohms. Looks like these are all hundreds of ohms. So, none of those are shorted. Now I'm going to do the same to these BJTs, making sure that they're not shorted. Any of the pins, there are three pin devices, so lots of combinations to check. I'll do that, and then I'll switch my multimeter to diode mode and make sure that I have about a 0.5 volt drop between all of these pins because the BJT is essentially two diodes back to back. And assuming all of that's good, then most likely everything on here is all right in terms of transistors. Uh, it's not guaranteed, but it's a good cursory test. After this sort of test, I just power it up and do that test through current li current limiting device. Yeah, it's really not uh, worth desoldering everything on this board to test it individually, so this is generally good enough. Now, there were also resistors on here that drive the gates, and those may not be good, even though the FETs are. So let me turn this over, and then we'll check those. This time I don't have my multimeter in frame, just that you can kind of see what I'm doing, but essentially it's these resistors here, and they go all the way down the line, one resistor per FET. So... I want to check and make sure that these resistors weren't blown open by excessive current because what can happen is when this FET fries, then the gate is now connected to the drain and the source of the FET, so all three pins are basically shorted together. And this resistor, which is only rated for one quarter watt, can now have tens of watts flowing through it, and it fries. Unfortunately, these transistors over here also can fry. Now, in this case, it wasn't connected very long, so I'm hoping that they didn't overheat enough to actually burn up. But the uh, resistors easily could. They fry pretty quickly. So I know that this FET is good. I just checked it. So now I can go across this resistor and see if this resistor is good. And this really does require just a multimeter. It says 10 ohms on that particular resistor. I'm going to go over to this other one, which I believe is just off frame. Nope, it's still on frame. And make sure that this one's the same. Yes. 9.8 ohms about. So... 10 ohm resistors, that's what these are. You could also look up the color codes on them, but I'm lazy, I use a multimeter. 
And now we'll go to this one. There should also be 10 ohms. It is reading 75 ohms. So this resistor is fried. If I replace the FET, the whole thing would still not work. So what I'm gonna do is replace this resistor with a uh, 10 ohm resistor. All right, resistors. I got this kit from Radio Shack, probably, ah, geez, when was that, 10 years ago. And let's see what it says. It says it has a 30 each of 1K, 10K, 100K, 10 each of 1 ohm, 10 ohm, 100 ohm. Well, that's good to know. So I should have around 10, depending on how many I've already used, 10 ohm resistors in here, along with all of these other values that's printed on the bag. So let's see what's in here. Uh, yeah. yeah, a bunch of resistors. Oh man. See, this is what happens when you don't spend the extra money to get a nice resistor kit. You end up with this. And uh, you know how I just said that I was lazy and I used my multimeter to read resistors? Well, this is one case where it is very good to know resistor color codes. Black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, gray, white. And those represent the values 0 through 9. And you can go through here and pick the right resistor based on that. Or you can take your multimeter and figure it out. But uh, resistor color codes are helpful. There are also tolerance and such details on here, which are good to know. But I want a 10 ohm resistor. 10 is 10R0. So 1, black, brown, so brown. 1, 0. So, let's see, let's take a look at this resistor here. Look at that, 10 ohms. So, in this case, knowing the resistor color codes helped me a great deal. In any case, that's kind of a, an obsolete bit of knowledge anymore. Triple resistors like this are not that common anymore, but every once in a while, it still comes in handy. So, there we go, 10 ohm resistors.